the lecture is reconciling the past to move into the future with confidence. I want you to examine those words very carefully because each one is very important. You ask yourself the question, why reconciling the past? What reconciling is there to do? Has there been a falling out, so we need to make up and become reconciled? And I want to suggest that the choice of that word is very, very appropriate because in many respects, we are not on good terms with our history, with our past, and we need to become reconciled to it. We need to know our past, we need to understand our past, and above all, we need to have a very positive attitude towards our past. The sad thing, of course, is that if we are not positive about our past, then we can hardly expect somebody who doesn't belong here, who is not a citizen, who wasn't born here, to have a positive attitude to our past. Now, there are some people who feel that history is unimportant, it's irrelevant. And a famous inventor, Henry Ford, is reputed to have said that history is bunk. And I want you to dismiss that statement as bunk. Because history is extremely important in the life of an individual and in the life of a country. Extremely important. We have tended to reject our history principally for two reasons. Those who are able to express it and articulate it, they say, well, our history is all about slavery and colonialism. And they then go on to say, well, I can do without both of those things. I don't want to be any part of that. I don't want to be reminded of it. And I'm here to say to you this morning very, very confidently that we cannot dismiss our history. It simply won't go away. We have to come to grips with it and to recognize that even though in some instances it might cause us some pain, some shame, some anger, we need to come to grips with it and recognize that whatever our history might have been, we have, it is part of us and we are part of it. Some people dismiss our history then because they say, well, slavery, slavery, it is such a terrible kind of experience, I don't want to be reminded of it. And at the same time, you have to remember that those persons who say that, at the same time, condemn themselves as if to say, well, we have been slaves and therefore we are not worthy. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, you will be so motivated that you will reject that kind of a view. Because we were not born slaves. We were, some of our people were enslaved. That is to say, cruel, oppressive people for reasons of greed and their own profit enslaved our ancestors in order that they might become powerful and rich. And so dismiss the notion, dismiss the notion that we are born slaves and that in some way we are inferior and that in some way Africa is a backward place and Africa has not done anything by way of contributing to the civilization of this world. I want you to understand that there are many, many myths which you need to explode and throw out of the window. Because if you continue to believe those negative things about yourself and about your country, then you're not going to get very far. It is totally, totally incorrect to say, well, we, people of the Caribbean, were enslaved because we're inferior. 
But that is what some people want us to believe, even today. And you have to get rid of that notion. Because, you see, slavery exists in the world today. And it exists for the same reason. That there are selfish, greedy, oppressive people who will enslave even their own people, even their own children, in order to make money. And essentially, this is what was happening to Africans. They were living free. They were a civilized people. They had their own religion. They had their own forms of government. But there were greedy people among them as well who fomented wars and who sold their own people into slavery in order that they might receive riches and power. And so it is not true to say that African people were born slave. But bear in mind that slavery has always been part of the history of mankind. Slavery has always been that way. It is evidence of man's inhumanity to man. Those of you who are good Sunday school students, how many of you attend Sunday school? Just let me see your hands. Or attend church? Well, isn't that wonderful? Nearly everybody in this room attends Sunday school. All right? But you will recall, you will recall that in, in the Old Testament is recorded the story of the Passover. And what was that about? That was not really about African people who were enslaved. These were Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. And so because of their faith in their God, because they believed that their God liberated them, because they believed the story of the Passover, you find that even today, thousands of years after, Jews celebrate the Passover. Now, if the Jews celebrate Passover, it is saying at least two things. That history is important to them. It is also saying that they will not be kept down. They will not be sub subordinated to the fact that they had, at a certain time in their history, been enslaved by others. And I think that this is the message which we have to get. We have to overcome the notion that, well, we feel shame. <laughs> we feel pain. We feel anger. Bear in mind, Mark, you that some of the things which happened, you hear of whippings, people who were whipped until they came within just a whisk, um, you know, of their own life. Because the society then was an extremely brutal and vicious kind of society, right? And sometimes you think of it and you have to dismiss the thought and not to, en not to keep in your heart any, 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 any hatred, any desire to, to retaliate, any desire to seek vengeance on anybody else, and you have to have a spirit of forgiveness and to move on. But the point I'm making is that we have to forget the myths. Africa was not a land of infidels. Africa was not a land of barbarians. On the contrary, many, many of the writers who have been researching the early history, that is before slavery was introduced into the Caribbean, the early history of Africa, will tell you that Africa was really the, 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 the birthplace of modern civilization. And I'll use one quotation, possibly two, just to make the point. A man named Chancellor Williams, who wrote a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization, says this, I quote, The blacks were among the very earliest builders of a great civilization on this planet, including the development of writing, sciences, engineering, medicine, architecture, religion, and the fine arts. Students, 
This is not the figment of my imagination. The literature is there. And I'm appealing to you to delve into that history, the early history of Africa, and to recognize that we today are descended from a great people, from a people who had achieved great things. But such is the nature of life, such is the nature of civilization, that sometimes even the greatest civilizations can be destroyed. Indeed, other civilizations which follow the African civilization, they have been destroyed. So do not allow anyone to say to you, well, look at what is happening in Africa today. How can you say that Africa was the birthplace, was the cradle of civilization? The facts are there. Read them, read them, and be inspired. Take pride in your heritage. And do not allow anyone to say to you that you are descended from people who are infidels and who are barbarians and who have not contributed anything to civilization. That quotation by Chancellor Williams was from a black man, a white man, Basil Davison, in his book, Africa in History, writes, I quote, Greek civilization derived its religion its philosophy, its mathematics, and much else from the ancient civilizations of Africa and above all from Egypt of the pharaohs. To those founding fathers in classical Greece, any notion that Africans were inferior morally or intellectually would have seemed silly." End of quote. What I'm trying to say is that the people who have done the hard work, the research, who have delved into the early history of Africa, will tell you that these were great people running their country in model ways, and that in so many respects, the Greeks and the Europeans and others who came after them learned all they could from the civilization of Africa. And so it is for us to learn our history to take pride in it, allow it to inspire us and motivate us to great things, and not to inhabit, not, not, to, not to allow any negative, negative thoughts to inhabit our minds and our spirits. We need then to reconcile ourselves to our history. We need to accept it for what it is and to extract the positives because, you see, even if you think of St. Kitt's history, you will have to recognize that St. Kitt's has had many firsts, you know. And sometimes it, 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 it annoys me even to hear people say today, well, St. Kitt's people must have come from the most backward part of Africa. And I say, well, that if we appear today to be, to, be, to be cowardly, if we appear today to be negative, it was not always so. The first slave revolt in the whole Caribbean took place in St. Kitts way back in 1639, I think it was. The point I'm making is that these were people who never submitted themselves to slavery. They had their pride. They had a strong self of, sense of self. They had strong self-esteem. And the idea that they should live the rest of their lives in subordination to others was totally, totally unacceptable to them. Much has been written by Europeans about emancipation. And one cannot deny that for their own reasons, in many cases, European philanthropists, European um, Christian leaders, they advocated the abolition of slavery. But never, never overlook the fact that our ancestors were there working every day. They were resisting in every conceivable way 
in order to try and win their freedom. Because for them, it was totally, totally unnatural and unacceptable that they should live in slavery. And so you have to bear in mind that our history, our history is not a history where people just waited for somebody to come and liberate them. They were part of the process. They were working, they were resisting, and they were doing all sorts of things in order to ensure that they would gain their freedom. And so when freedom or emancipation came in 1834, officially, because in reality, the reality was something else, officially you had emancipation. A remarkable thing happened in St. Kitts, and we do not have evidence that it happened elsewhere. These people who were forced to be so docile, and who were kept under the whip, and who were being punished and oppressed, as if to a single individual, they all put down their tools, and they went on strike. And many of them fled to the hills. And many of them said, well, leave the animals, let the animals take care of themselves. And they wanted to demonstrate that freedom was theirs, legally, naturally. And they were not going to be subordinated any longer. Because as you may well recall from your history lesson, the arrangement was that you had a halfway house between full freedom and emancipation. And many of the slaves got wind and said, well, I want you to remember that the queen, so they saw it, Queen Victoria, had given us our freedom. And it is the masters who wanted to deprive us of our freedom. And therefore, we are going on strike. This is not the activity of a people who were ignorant, who were docile, who could not understand, and who didn't know instinctively and naturally what their rights were. These are people who had a sense of their own worth and their own dignity and were prepared to do what was necessary in order to achieve that. And so this led almost naturally to St. Kitts being in 1935 the place where Caribbean uprisings, disturbances, call them what you will, started again. These were not people who were intimidated. These were not people who were unsure about what they wanted. They knew that if they wanted freedom, if they wanted better wages, if they wanted better living conditions, they would have to do something about it. And so when, in 1935, it turned out that the estate manager said to them, well, there'll be no increase in wages, they then down their tools and started marching from one end of the island to the next. And the beautiful thing about it is that there was a sense of unity. There was a sense of solidarity. I want you to judge as young people whether we as a people have that sense of oneness and unity and solidarity? Or is it that we have allowed too many things to divide us? I'm saying that there's a direct link between what happened in 1834, 1835, to what happened in 1935. Because, you see, when they had the understanding, even though they were talking about emancipation, uh, they felt it in their bones that it was not for real. And this is when they rioted. This is when they rebelled and said, well, we want better. And we are prepared to pay the sacrifice in order that we might have things better, not only for ourselves, but most importantly, for their children. And this is one of the remarkable things about African people. They have a strong sense of family. And so you found that there were mothers, and in some cases there were also fathers, 
who had such a strong sense of family that they were prepared to make any sacrifice that you can think about in order to be sure that things will be better for their children. Do you think we still have that? No, not as much. Not as much. That's an honest answer, not as much. And part of history yeah, is to understand it and to know it and to say, well, the things which we have lost, because they're so important to us, we have to work together to, to revive them, to bring them back. Because we, we're the ones suffering. Because those values and those virtues which were common among our ancestors are no longer common among us. When I was growing up as a boy in Challengers, it really did not matter to adults whose child I was if I was doing something which was considered naughty, to use a nice word, I would be chastised there and then. And in addition, in addition, whoever that adult was who had chastised me and told me not to do this and not to do that, they would go and speak to my mother. And one of the remarkable things about this whole situation was that sometimes the mothers, the parents were not even on talking terms, as we say. But nevertheless, such was their, their, their determination to make sure that that little boy or that little girl did not do anything wrong, that he remained on the straight and narrow, that they made sure they go on to say, well, I see your daughter, I see your son, and I want you to talk to him, I want you to talk to her. The adults were there doing all that they possibly could in order to save the generation. We had a sense of pride. We had a sense of belonging. We had a sense of the continuity of the family. They recognized that, listen, the country is going to be as strong or as, or as good as the individual boys and girls who grow up to be good and devoted citizens to the country. Do we do that anymore? Not as much. So history is saying to us, we need to understand how those things worked for us and benefited us. And we have to dedicate ourselves to bringing back, to reviving and renewing so many of those wonderful things which, in spite of their being poverty, in spite of their being disease, in spite of their being oppression, I want to say to you that, you know, the spirit of our people was never, never, never broken. Never broken in spite of all that they did. They could not eradicate from our people that sense of their own destiny, their own worth, their own self-pride. And I think that this is what we need to cultivate in each and every one of us. We need then to be moving forward. But I want to suggest to you that we can't move forward unless we have a knowledge of the past, an understanding of the past, a positive attitude towards the past, and above all, we need to become reconciled to the past. We cannot be heard to say, well, it doesn't matter. It happened a long time ago, and therefore, it doesn't affect us. Because, you see, there are times I reflect on the history of Nevis compared to the history of St. Kitts. And what happens is that if you ask yourself the question, why is it? Why is it there are so many family names in Nevis up to this day, which are fairly commonplace? And you can almost say if somebody has a surname, Liebird. All right. Morton, anyone name Morton? All right. I mean, there are scores of family names. 
which you can identify, which you can identify with Nevis. Hmm? You, you name them. Smitten, Lyburn, Joseph. Joseph, all right, we'll take, we'll take that, all right? Right? But what I'm, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the history of the two islands turned out to be different. So that whereas, whereas they had emancipation around the same time, conditions in St. Kitts under the plantation system was so extremely bad that you had Kittishans just wanting to go anywhere in the world that they could possibly escape to. And so one of the haunting, one of the haunting statistics of the history, the modern history of St. Kitts, tells us that between the years roughly 1900 and 1930, the population of St. Kitts fell by 43%. People were just going away. Wherever they could get to go, they were going. So extremely bad were the conditions in St. Kitts. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it is not therefore surprising because a similar thing was not happening in Nevis. And therefore, the Nevisian family remained somewhat stronger, more coherent, more cohesive, and today the Nevis society is rather different from the St. Kitts society. Because, you see, as people went away, the vacuum had to be filled. And you found people coming in from Nevis and Guilla and Tiga and Dominica, not to go any further because that, that was then the Leeward Islands colony. They came in and they filled the vacuum. And the point I'm making is that because of that emigration and because of this immigration to fill the vacuum, you're going to find that the stock, the citizen stock, if you will, of St. Kitts has been somewhat watered down, diminished. And what is the result? It means that Kittitians have tended to be not as patriotic because a country losing almost 50% of its population means that a lot of the people, the teachers, the farmers, the workers, whatever, they've, they've all gone. And the country has lost a lot of its memory. Nevis has not been, a, has, has not been um, affected in the same way. You ask yourself, why? I'm trying to explain that history affects us still. Because, you see, whereas St. Kitts, because it was an extremely fertile island, because sugar and the plantation system were doing extremely well, the planters who owned all of these estates were determined just to dig their heel in and not to give way to any kind of peasantry. Because you see, in, 19, in 1896, 1897, you had the Norman Commission coming to St. Kitts and making the recommendation that the plantation system should be modified in order to ensure that plantation workers were able to get some land of their own so that they could establish a peasantry. But that did not happen. It happened in Nevis, and so you're going to find that today, the land tenure system in Nevis is very different from the land tenure system in St. Kitts. And if you want to if you want to help people to grow their pride, their confidence, their sense of self, let them have some land. Let them have title to land. Let them live on a piece of land knowing that nobody could chase them off of it. You go to Anguilla, 
and you meet a man or a woman, they need not be dressed in any fancy anything, but they have such a rich sense, such a strong sense of self, because regardless of how they look or what you might think about them, they may have a few acres of land in some part of Anguilla. And that is what gives them pride and strength and a sense of their own individual personhood. So I'm saying that we need to become reconciled to our history and to recognize that there are some good points, there are some outstanding points, there are some heroes and heroines who we need to get to know, to get, to, 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 to get acquainted with. We're not talking about heroes and heroines just in the book after they're dead. We're talking about individuals who today are living heroic lives. They're making sacrifices. They're doing all the right things for the benefit of their families, for the benefit of, the, of their community. They are looking out for their brother. They are, in fact, their brother's and sister's keeper. We need to become more acquainted with who we are, with our rich heritage. The theme speaks about confidence. Do you recognize how we have become paralyzed in many instances because we lack Confidence? Just think about it for a minute. If you do not have confidence, then you won't even try. And so, as I said before, the words of the theme are extremely important. Because we lack confidence in many, many instances, we become very touchy, very, you know, Irritable. But if you are confident, things fall on your back and they fall off. You're able to move ahead even though you encounter some difficulty. You can move on. I'm going to give you two examples. One not belonging to us, the other belonging to us. Way back in 1954, and Mr. Lazar will bear me out. Not that he was alive then. <laughs> There was a man named Roger Bannister. And Roger Bannister, like the other people of his time, believed it was humanly impossible for anybody to run a mile under four minutes. But on a famous day in 1954, Bannister who felt that he could, he felt he could, he must be able to do it. It is not beyond human capacity. And he did it. He ran a mile, 3.59 seconds or something like that, uh, minutes, sorry. And the remarkable thing about it is that within weeks, within weeks of him running that mile in under four minutes, you had people all over the world doing the same thing. Because they now believed that it could be done, and therefore they were able to do it. I want you to recognize Kim Collins has been much in the news recently. And kudos to him. Kudos to him and to the other young athletes whom he is evidently helping and motivating. But just think of Kim Collins, young man from St. Kitts. Now, if he didn't have the world of confidence in himself, could he even make it beyond St. Kitts? Much more to become a world champion? What we are saying is that we need to reconcile ourselves to our history. If we are going to move forward, we need to be able to have develop a positive attitude towards our history. And only when we have done those things would we grow and develop the confidence which we need to have. Confidence is mightily important. If you keep on telling yourself, well, 
I, I, I'm a victim. Uh, poor me. Hmm? If you don't have that confidence, if you don't break out of that mode and be positive, be positive. Yes, I can. Yes, I have the ability. Yes, I'm prepared to overcome the obstacles. One famous character in the United States used the phrase, winners never quit. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. You got to be prepared to keep on, to keep on and on. You fall down, but you get up again because your confidence says to you, yes, I can, I can do it. And then you recognize that quitters never win. If you tell yourself it's too hard, if you tell yourself I can't possibly do it, then you're going nowhere. It's not surprising then Louis that Louis um, himself a great athlete in his time says, if you don't have confidence, you'll always find a way not to win. All right? Always find a way not to win. How many of you here perhaps are just overcome by the negatives? You feel that, well, I, I can't do it. I mean, there's no point even trying. But you recognize that if you took a positive view of your own talents, your own ability, and your, the contribution which you can make, then you'd be forever trying. You'd be forever trying. Because the characters in history that you recognize and admire so much did not do it just easy so. They had to overcome many, many difficulties. They fell down and they got up again. They suffered their reversals and they were prepared to move on. Such was their confidence, such was their courage. And I pray to God that in you and among you here this morning are confident young people, courageous young people who believe that yes, I can. Yes, I can make a difference. Yes, all is not lost. I'm prepared to, to do my best. And I believe that in doing my best, there are others who will follow my example. The last section of this I want to speak on has to do with self-liberation. How, how do we overcome all of the terrible, terrible negatives of slavery? and of colonialism. How do we do that? You have to recognize that the aim of slavery was to dehumanize people. In fact, they did not really regard them as people. They wanted to rob them of their very humanity. They wanted to use them as if they were just animals for the work that they can do and the labor that they could provide. And so they did everything possible. They robbed them of their religion. They robbed them of their culture. And they told them, well, that was inferior. That was barbaric. They were trying to, you know, rob these people of the very, hum the, 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 the very essence, if you will, of humanity. That's what they were trying to do. And I'm saying again, my brothers and sisters, that attitude will not just go away because you ignore it. Because you ignore what the slave masters tried to do over 200 years. Because you ignore it, it is not just going to go away. We have to have a positive, a positive strategy in order to overcome all of those negatives. These were people who felt that, listen, Massa knows best, and therefore you're not expected to think, even though you had a brain. These are people who tried what was known as divide and rule. Keep them divided. Play one off against the other. I'm saying these are the tools which the slave owners used in their time. We have to recognize them as what they are. 
what they were at the time and what they are still. Because what is truly troubling about modern Caribbean society, including St. Kitts society, is that so many of the tools which were employed by the slave owners continue to be used today. Instead of striving for unity, we are using division. Instead of empowering people and getting them to understand that, listen, your destiny is in your hand. God has given you gifts and talents, and it is for you to develop those gifts and talents. It is as if you are to remain dependent. And not surprisingly, there are things which some people do not wish to do for themselves. They want the government to do this or somebody else to do it. And that kind of dependency is not healthy. But these are all born out of a slave society. So the big challenge now, the big challenge now is how do we, how do we try to liberate our minds? I think this is all part of the process. Unless you know your history, unless you can take pride in it, unless you have a strong sense of self, your own worth, your own dignity, then you're just going to be, you know, swept along by events. But if you have a sense of your own worth, your own importance, that you have a particular role, that God has put you in this world for a purpose. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. And it is important for you to work in order to develop those talents and those gifts and those graces. Marcus Garvey. I'd say the last word to him. Marcus Garvey, remarkable man, and you have to read what he said. You have to read what others who, are, who understood him have said, and not to read what the oppressors said about him, because most of them would say, well, he was a racketeer, he was this, he was that, he was the other. But the man had such tremendous vision because what he wanted to do was to bring about a unification of the entire African race. And to the extent that that could not be accommodated in the West, in the United States, that is why he talked about going back to Africa. So that in Africa, they would be able to promote the spirit of racial pride and love. How we need that a sense of, a spirit of racial pride and love. Somebody has said that of all the terrible things which slavery did to our ancestors, perhaps the worst thing which it has done is to leave us with a sense of self-hatred. Anybody here hate yourself? Do you hate yourself? Do you hate yourself? Or do you love yourself? From your hair, your nose, your lips, right down? Because, you see, you got to be careful. You've got to be very careful because they tell me that a few billion dollars are spent by black people in the United States to do something about their hair, their looks, their whatever else. So now, if you love yourself, why did you try to why did you try why is it you're spending so much money on wanting to be somebody else or to look in a different way? Alright? So we have to watch that. We have to love ourselves for who we are. We have to love our brothers and sisters and not be guilty of this, what has become known as black on black crime. We have black people killing, you know, their own brothers and sisters as if they were flies, having no respect for them, no reverence for life. This is the message which I think Marcus Garvey was trying to get across. 
And he had the vision that, listen, if only I could raise the money, if only I can buy these wonderful ships and establish the Black Star Line, then our people will be going back home. And in that home of Africa, they will be able to demonstrate to the rest of the world something of what Africa was in the days, in the early days, when Africa was the cradle of civilization. That was his vision. And so Marcus Garvey was the one who said, in terms of advocating the liberation of our minds, he said, I quote, we have outgrown slavery, but our minds are still enslaved to the thinking of the master race. Now, take the kinks out of your mind instead of out of your hair. It's a mind, it's a mind, it's a mind, it's a mind. We need to liberate our minds. And as Bob Marley would have said, none but ourselves can free our minds. We got to do it. Because we have to recognize that those negative ideas about inferiority and those negative ideas of dependency and those negative ideas of divisiveness, they are the ones holding us back. The distrust which we have for each other, we're not prepared to trust each other. We don't love each other and that is why you have all of these terrible, terrible, terrible murders. Because there's so much hatred. So let us end on a positive note. I'm saying that slavery is evidence of man's inhumanity to man. Black people were not enslaved because they came out of Africa or because they were inferior. That is not the case. If white people were available, they would abuse white people. If white people were as strong physically as black people were, because as you know, the Amerindians were tried here in the Caribbean before the Africans came. Europe, Europeans came out and many of them died off, tropical diseases of one sort or another. But the Africans were strong, not only physically, but spiritually. Whenever, whenever, I, go up, whenever I go up to Brimstone Hill, I take, I take a little time just to reflect on the wonder of it all. Because the canons, the stones, how did they get up there? It was thanks to the strength and the stamina and the determination of black people in the hot sun with the whips on their back. And it was not just a matter of physical strength. You look at the architecture of Brimstone Hill today and you recognize that our people were not just strong, but, but our people were skillful. They had skills, they had knowledge, they had a mind. Look around you and you'll recognize that we are not second class to anyone. We have the same talents, we have the same abilities, but so much depends on us. Whether we are able now to liberate our minds and in the process, in the process, to realize our full potential as a people. That is the challenge. I believe you can do it. I believe you can do it. And I believe that this series of lectures might well be the turning point when the high school students of St. Kitts begin to say, well, you know, I have to see myself differently. I have to see myself differently. I have to see my brother and my sister differently. I have to show more love. I have to show more reverence. 
I have to work for unity by showing that, yes, I care about my brother and my sister. I believe that it can be done. And take my word, I have confidence in you. Thank you. Any questions from anyone in the audience, please show your hand and we will have you the question. Um, there were many methods used to control the slaves. One in which is keep the body physically strong but psychologically depending on the slave master, which again could be interpreted as keep the body strong but take the brain. Do you think that this method is still effective in the black society today? That's a very, very profound question. And I'll begin to, answering, to answer that question by referring to some, something which in history is called the Willie Lynch letter. Yes. Oh, you've heard about Willie Lynch letter? Yes. Now, bear in, mind, bear in mind that there are some people who doubt the authenticity of the letter. There are some people who say, no, it was not written by Willie Lynch in 1712. It was written sometime later by somebody else. Now, if it was in fact with, written by Willie Lynch in 1712, you're going to find that next year is what? How many years? How many years? How many years? 1712 to 2012. 1712 to 2012. 300 years. I, I know we have mathemat mathematicians among us, right? And so, what is remarkable is that in that letter, in describing the tools which he was recommending for keeping slaves in subjection, he said, well, keep them divided. Keep them divided. Use a house slave against the field slave. Use those with a little straight hair against those with the natty hair. Use every conceivable division you can and you're going to find that if you do that, and he actually said it, he said you'd be able to keep these people in subjection for 300 years. I'd encourage you to read it and come to your own conclusion. Because if you look at it, you're going to find that many, many, many of the tools, many, many of the methods which were used in slavery are still being practiced today. That's the honest truth. So I thank you for your question. You spoke about the first slave revolt happening, you think it's in 1639, I think. Um, I would like to know where I can find some information on that so I can do some further reading. I hope I have the date right, but I'm pretty certain it was 1639. Um, the first source I would recommend is the Heritage, what used to be Heritage Society, the National the St. Christopher um, Trust. Um, what used to be Heritage Society at the Treasury Building, I'm sure they have literature on it. I recall getting from them a pamphlet a few years ago um, giving specifics, you know, of the particular slave revolt. Right? The point of that, I'm not advocating rebellion and revolt and riots, okay? I'm not advocating that. But I'm saying that, you know, as early as then, not in Jamaica, not in Barbados, not anywhere else, it was in St. Kitts. And I'm saying there's something about the soil and the environment of St. Kitts that seemed to bring that out in our people, starting way back in 16... Um, 39, we come on down to um, 1834, we had problems in 1896, and the people were so, so bold, so brave, so, I mean, nothing could hold them back. There are reports indicating that after 1896, you had the 1935 riots, and the day following the, the Tuesday, the main events took place on the Monday. The Tuesday, it's recorded officially 
that there were women taunting the police and taunting the defense force, telling them, shoot Don't me shoot now, me nothing now. in your... Hmm? Now, this might have been considered, you know, to be foolhardy, but what I'm saying is that those people had reached a point in terms of their own decision, you know, to make a difference, that they were prepared to pay whatever sacrifice. And I'm saying, for the benefit of all of us, if today, if today we are lacking in that courage, courage to stand up for what we believe in, courage to pray, to pay whatever sacrifice is necessary, then do not blame our ancestors. The fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our ancestors, but in ourselves. Remember that, young people? If I if I had the means of weighing it up or analyzing it, I would say it is rather more negative than positive. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm saying that the influence, the negative influences in so many cases outweigh the positive. All right? It is only the other day I was listening to a radio program and this person said, well, in St. Kitts, um, a lot of people commit murder without shedding any blood. And it sounded a bit contradictory to begin with. But I thought of it and I said, you know, that caller may well be much wiser than he recognized. Because there's so many wars going on in St. Kitts. There are wars going on. There are people who will, you know, just want to see you out of the way. Killed, disabled, put aside. And so personal, interpersonal relations are particularly, particularly bad. And this is one of the reasons why I personally am an advocate for integrity in public life legislation. Not because of what it will supposedly do among politicians and public officers, but I honestly feel that it needs to set a tone for the country, for the country to declare that, listen, integrity, honesty, fairness, decency, this is what we stand for in this 21st century. And I believe that it will make a contribution to improving personal relationships, and I believe it would be an important tool in all of the problems we're having, fighting gangs and what have you, what have you. Because when there is no integrity in public life legislation, it gives the impression that there are no standards. You can do what you want, so long as you get away with it. And I'm really, I've made the call already, and I'm making it again, that the time is ripe for us to have integrity in public life legislation not just for what it might or might not do in relation to politicians and public officers, but in terms of setting norms and values and standards for the society as a whole. For us to declare, now listen, integrity matters for us as a people. All of us need to act with integrity and with honesty and with decency and with fairness. So I think that that would be an important weapon in fighting so many of the negatives which tend to, you know. I'm not saying that the majority of us as people are lacking in integrity. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the negatives, you know, it may be a minority of the population, but the negative which they, which they, which they give off, which they exude, is tending to overwhelm the positive. Is it in your belief that the syllabus should be 
changed in order to, to in order to integrate more history about our own nation, other than the history of other people and people far away and such yeah. and such. I would like to think that um, even while it is taking time to introduce it formally into the curriculum, into the school syllabuses, and so on and so on and so on. That opportunities like this can be can be can be can be utilized. I would like to think that um, you know the radio and television. I wish somebody would put a microphone um, in front of somebody like Washington Archibald and let him let him talk, let him express himself in terms of our history and so forth and so on. We're not all going to agree ever, but we need to know. We need to know so that we can make up our own minds and we can take some pride. Compare the United States and how they make such a wonderful thing of their history. Hmm? Later this month, you're having Thanksgiving. And whether they were actually born in the United States, they, they, it is a time when they all get together, the symbolism. They were celebrating the other day the Statue of Liberty. Hmm? Every opportunity which we have to celebrate our history, to make it known, to get people involved so that they might take a sense of pride and so on. We must not miss it. So in addition to what will be done in terms of the schools, I'm hoping that, you know, additionally, in the community, or, you know, and through the media, etc., that we'd be all learning more and more and more about our history. Because I tell you, St. Kitts history is truly, truly fascinating. Truly fascinating. On behalf of the UNESCO Slave Road Project Committee, we'd all like to offer sincere thanks to our presenter, Sopro Beginners.